All right, on to the final letter here. We have S tweet from Eminence, uh, Missouri. <clears throat> and again, I know that this one's been here for a while. I have not had a chance to get to this one. <sighs> so I'm sorry about that. I'm trying to get to this stuff finally. Um, <clears throat> good day, brother. I trust you are well and blessed during this season of the year. Where to begin? A brief brief background and testimony of God's goodness and mercy, I suppose. I'm a preacher's kid, the youngest of my dad's children. He was an evangelist ordained in the charismatic Pentecostal type of religiosity. Although at this point in my own work, walk, excuse me, I recognize the false teaching that these types promote. I believe dad had true salvation through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And I hope to see him in heaven some sweet day. My mother is still living, and I pray that she has trusted the gospel of grace also, but the evidence is difficult to see in her life. She did not receive a good childhood education, and her reading comprehension is very low. Therefore, she has relied on television preachers, of whom Jimmy Swaggart is her favorite, <laughs> for most of her life. My mother usurped Dad's authority as head of his family when my sister and I were still very young. He was not allowed to discipline his children. It's a reality, the results of which are borne out, in many negative ways. Yes, I've seen that the Pentecostal charismatic system produces very strong feministic type women. My grandmother was that way, my maternal grandmother. I was seven or so when I recognized I was a lost sinner in need of a savior and trusted in Jesus as my savior at that time. What followed, however, was a few decades of unreliable teaching, no training or discipline when it came to the study of scripture, Striving with my flesh to please God, countless failures, and 30 years of living in lesbian relationships. So many years wasted. God's long suffering towards me, his mercy upon me is humbling. I am so thankful and grateful that he allowed me to live and to begin to learn to put my flesh under and learn to study to show myself approved, to be a witness of his goodness, to be a difference in someone else's life. I am not married, not uh, opposed to marriage. But men my age do not pay attention to me, and I couldn't name a solitary man my age in my area that is grounded in the word. Uh, therefore, none are viable candidates. I work a regular job and find that I rely heavily on preachers and teachers on YouTube and other formats. Another example of God's goodness is the way he opened my eyes to the errors of charismatic Pentecostalism, the errors of 501c3 churches, in quotations, the errors of taking the entirety of Scripture and mashing it together to somehow make it apply to me and the rest of Christendom when we must rightly divide the Scripture according to God's gospel messages through the dispensations of times. Um, there's a precious few in the area where I live that have has a heart to fellowship outside brick-and-mortar buildings and who trust the AV 1611 as the sole authority, the standard by which everything must be measured, although sadly there's one married couple who still use uh, New King James Version for their son, and the man uses the RV. Um, <clears throat> I'm thankful for these few with whom I can fellowship. We are a motley crew who gather in each other's homes to study and fellowship. We don't really have one man to whom we look to to bring forth lessons from the Word. We just read from the Word, discuss points within the text, pretty much on any topic that strikes our interest. It's not the greatest system, but it's... What we have, and I believe God will bless our efforts, but to learn to strive lawfully, how? I have been selectively listening to a handful of different men who rightly divide and have grown spiritually in the grace and knowledge of God and His Word. Some things you've brought out have caused me considerable cognitive dissonance, though. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, should I continue to listen to men who have church buildings? Where is the line between hyper-dispensationalists and those who rightly divide? How do we go about establishing the proper balance, proper division? Okay, well, um, there are men that say some really good stuff and uh, you can learn some things from them that have church buildings, Peter Ruckman being one of them, obviously. Um, but what I'm trying to say is I'm, I say be careful about the church building preachers because I don't want people to just start to look to them and say everything that they say is right. Rightly divide the word of truth. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say there. Um, where is the line between hyper-dispensationalists and those who rightly divide? Hyper-dispensationalists, the primary way that you can spot them is that they separate the, the body of Christ, the church age, into two different dispensations. You have Jesus and 
you know, Peter, John, you know, the early apostles until you get to Paul and then Paul till the rapture. That's a hyper dispensationalist. They really get messed up and they make this big deal. We shouldn't be baptizing because Paul didn't baptize anybody, even though he says, you know, I didn't baptize anyone but Crispus and Gaius, I think. Um, so he did baptize people. But they'll make a big deal about baptism. They'll make a big deal about the church of the one body and, and they get into all this other kooky stuff. Um, <clears throat> but Paul plainly teaches that there were others in Christ before me. Um, the book of Romans, I think it talks about that. So you have, to, you have to be careful about these people that say nothing other than, you know, before Paul. That's all for the other church there and repentance is for them and not for us. And that, hyper dispensationalism is a, is a big cultic thing there. Um, but proper balance, proper division, uh, final authority is the scriptures. And that's what it really goes back to. And so if you start to watch guys that have church buildings, you get some blessings out of them, like Ruckman or some of the other guys, great, praise the Lord. But be really careful because they know that they're, doing, that they're not following the scriptures and they're continuing to do their church building thing. Um, that's a problem. And Peter Ruckman has openly written in his commentaries about that he knew that he was compromising, he knew that he was covering up for sin, and he had people, wicked people in his congregation. And I can't really say a whole lot because then I would, you know, mess up the congregation and people would go their own ways and we can't really live by the New Testament completely like they once did. And it gets dangerous. Okay. Um, that was for me, then hi, I guess. <laughs> if we as the body of Christ here and after... BOC, she's writing here, are found in the Gospels. How am I to rightly divide the kingdom gospel with its various requirements from the gospel given to Paul? Um, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, um, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. So you go through the Gospels, you go through the Old Testament. If there are certain things that have never gone away, then you apply that. If there are other things that have, um, we no longer have to go to the temple and, you know, do animal sacrifices or whatever. We don't have to go to Jerusalem, you know. So, and that stuff was going on in the Gospels. Well, we don't need to do that stuff anymore. Okay, so comparing Scripture with Scripture. Um, from the Gospel given to Paul, with only the requirement, with the only requirement being faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. First Corinthians fifteen one through four. The body of Christ wasn't even revealed during Christ's earthly ministry. Am I wrongly in the hyper camp to say, stay primarily in Paul's epistles for my edification? Um, well, no, you're not, but just don't make it into a thing of there isn't anything else there. You know, the Bible says, you know, Paul actually wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 6, if any man consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is proud knowing nothing, but doting about questions and stripes of words, whereof cometh envy and strife and railings and evil surmisings, I think. Probably, probably have my word order a little bit mixed up there. I try to answer these, you know, letters as quickly as I can. But um, <clears throat> you should consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. The problem is when you just say it has to come from Paul and nobody else. That's when you're getting into the hyper dispensational heresy. Um, after all, Scripture says, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Romans 2.16 it is then of utmost importance to know our gospel. It is of utmost importance to study the, the epistles wherein the body of Christ is, where the address and content is primarily to us. I agree with that. Are we as the body of Christ found in the prof prophetic books of the Bible? If some of the teachings I've heard are true, the body of Christ can't be found. Um, there is nothing whatsoever concerning one new man, Ephesians 2.15, that Gentiles would be saved through Israel by being proselytized by a blessing, a Jew, almsgiving, etc., right? Was the only hope a Gentile had to be saved, right? Is it proper to say their belief alone was sufficient to save them or that they had to do the works mentioned? Therefore, is it proper for me to believe that I cannot take any Old Testament promises, God's chosen people, and apply them to myself of this church age? Ugh. <laughs> um, yeah, I get it. Uh, <clears throat> you have to be careful. If it's specifically to the nation of Israel, 
um, like the prayer of Jabez, there was a whole thing came out. Max Lucado came out and he was taking this thing and Lord bless me, bless me indeed. And it's some kind of magical formula. And now you get what you want. Uh, you get a new car or something. No, no. Um, you have to be careful about some of that stuff. But you can look back at the Old Testament, read the Old Testament, and see how God blesses a righteous nation. God blesses a righteous man or a woman. And then you can say that and say, okay, instruction in righteousness. That's there. Does it contradict the Pauline epistles that are written towards me? No, it doesn't. Okay, then go with it. If a church is a called out assembly, wouldn't the Israelites called out of Egypt be the first body? Acts chapter 7 verse 38. Then the believers who were baptized with John's baptism, another body, the little flock of Luke 12, 32. Then a totally unheard of body consisting of neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, Galatians 3, 28, Colossians 3, 11. Is it uh, proper exegesis to believe that God's program for Israel has been suspended after Stephen was stoned? Acts 7, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 25, and the body of Christ is called away, after which it, the prophetic program, is resumed. And after God begins to deal with Israel again, the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7, how then do I fit the body of Christ into this prophe prophesied, prophesied time, except as God sees fit, for he will have glorified bodies like, we will have glorified bodies like Jesus' resurrected body, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. <clears throat> well, um, again there, uh, it's great to be technical, but don't get overwhelmed by the details, okay? Um, keep it simple. Just understand, you know, you can get into some of this stuff there and you say, yeah, okay, it's true there doctrinally, but the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. We're supposed to study. The things that are written aforetime are written for our learning that we, through patience, you know, um, Sorry, my mind's can't think of the, how the rest of the verse goes. But the things that are written are four time are written for our learning. We're supposed to study the entirety of the Bible and not just isolate Paul's teachings and say, I can't read anything else. It leads me into error or something. No, be real careful about that. Um, <clears throat> going back to the letter here. The gospel by which believers are saved changes according to God's wisdom. Sovereignty and the counsel of his own will. Yes, thank God I have been saved in this dispensation. Now that I have eyes to see the distinctions, I know, thought I knew, that it's wrong for me to claim any promise that God made to the physical, literal seed of Abraham, true Israelites, a promise to possess the land forever. And I cannot claim rights to the covenant he made with his chosen people. I must stay in my unprophesied dispensation with its own promises, right? Um, well, it's not unprophesied. I think that that's one of the errors there, that it was this mysterious thing that never, never shows up. You can see little snippets here and there of the Lord going to Gentile believers in the future throughout the Old Testament. It's there. Um, doctrinally, no. It's not taught doctrinally that you know at such a time that this is going to happen and there will be the body of Christ time period and we'll put this whole thing on hold you know, and whatever else in the midst of the week and all the other stuff. No, that's not there. You can understand. We look back now and see it because we have the completed scripture. You know, we can see the future and the past now. But at the time of the writing and things, they didn't understand a lot of, of what was going on there. Um, I have heavenly promises wherein I am to rule and reign with Christ, not a promise of the land earth. Um, I believe that position to which Jesus will assign me will be a position in the heavenly realm, but like Jesus, not strictly confined there. I believe this pro because Scripture tells us that there are thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, Colossians 1.16, that are occupied by Satan's fallen angels. He is the God of this world, and he has his minions who rule with him, right? Revelation 12 reveals the time when they uh, will all be cast down from those positions to wage a battle with Michael and his angels which they lose, who then, if not the body of Christ, will occupy these vacant positions. Well, okay, correction here real quickly. Um, <clears throat> let me actually go to the scripture. Um, I've been preaching and doing videos now for a couple hours. I can feel my throat starting to get sore, so I have to keep things moving here. Um, as far as, 
Uh, what you said there about you're going to be reigning in the heavenly realm, not on the earth. There's no inheritance on the earth. Uh, not true. Um, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. It's not talking about Jews. Okay, uh, They're not out of every uh, kindred and tongue and people and nation. No. Um, it's talking about redeemed saints. Verse 10, And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Uh, so yes, saints, there's millennial inheritance there. There's, you'll be live with the Lord for the thousand years that he's down here on the earth. So, <clears throat> just to get that covered. Um, I hope this is not a big confusion. I hope you can understand the quandary of my situation. I don't have a husband spiritual leader to find shelter in, to lean on for guidance. I am terribly pressed for time to study. One reason I listen to YouTube so much. At 52 years old, I don't have the energy to arise early and to stay up late and hold a job and take care of all of life's tasks. Boo-hoo, right? <laughs> um, salute your lovely wife and handsome son for me, please. It is a thrill to witness you all as an example of... Uh, God's design for marriage and family. Thank you for your ministry, brother. I'll be waiting your response with much anticipate, anticip, anticipation. <laughs> Get it out yet. God bless you. Amen. Maranatha. And uh, so, um, yeah. So there's that one. Let me get this thing back into the envelope here. Again, there's the ministry address on the back. Again, I apologize that it took me so long to get around to this one. Um, this one is probably the oldest one I had to answer. It was on top of my computer. Every day I come in here to work on my computer to do research, reply to comments, reply to emails, all the stuff um, that I'm thankful for, but it's a lot of work. And also homeschooling my son and whatever else, you know. Um, <clears throat> and I keep looking up there at those letters stacked up and thinking, oh, man, I have to get to that. Um, so, but to hit, hopefully I've answered your questions. Um, if you have any kind of other thoughts or whatever else, anybody out there, say, could you please do a study on that? I'm curious about that myself. So, um, thank you again for the letter, and uh, we'll see everybody in the next study.